How do we plot a cast shadow caused by a white light placed above and to the left of this little still life of a green box and some scattered colored shapes? First of all, we know that the light is above and to the left, but whether it's in front or behind this scene is determined by its ground point. In other words, if you imagine a stick or a rope or string or line that drops from the light source and where it touches the ground, which right here is arbitrary as was the original placement of the white light, once we have those two points, the light and the ground, that ground point tells us clearly that this is behind, not in front of this scene. By merely placing it here in perspective, we can change whether the light falls toward us or away from us, to the left or to the right. But we do need the two points, and with those two points, drawing a line, for example, from the white light source through each of the critical top corners, the four corners of this box, we can determine the general direction in which this shadow is being cast. But in addition, we'll also have to add the ground lines, which, not go, which do not go through the top corners here, but rather through the bottom corners. I have pre-drawn this just to save some time here, and if we place our lines in particular locations of the white light source, each of these, a straight line connecting with each of the corners that we can see here, and those lines will go on indefinitely unless they're interrupted, as they are here, here, and here, by a corresponding light from the ground point. And the ground point line going from the ground point through the bottom corners as the light source went through the top corners where, where they intersect should determine where the critical corners of our cast shadow will appear. So I've <clears throat> drawn a, a shape that will fit into that pattern and I think you can see here the cast shadow like a black film of about 20 or 30 percent opacity will touch each of those critical corners corresponding to the critical corners up here. And once that is placed, we say, well, there's the cast shadow, and we can see it clearly has affected the, the magenta circle as well as the dark blue circle and the orange and the yellow. But we are going to add an additional factor, and that is a little touch of blue here, which would indicate that the shadow of this light source being white, the complement would be black. But we have an additional factor, and that is the blue sky overhead, which I have indicated by selecting an ambient blue, which will also affect the color of that cast shadow. So now that we have the, the two elements together, we have a cast shadow, which if you'll notice is a, a little greater in contrast over the lighter colors than over the darker colors. The darker colors absorbing more light and it works exactly as in nature if we recognize that a cast shadow is basically a film. In this case, a film composed of both black, because it's the complement of the light source, and blue, which is the ambient light, taking not anything from the bright light that we see here, where the light is actually shining on it, but where there is an absence of light, we add that ambient blue. Now, if we shine a light on this box, what happens to the top of the box? Well. Uh, it may get a little bit lighter, so we'll add a little bit of brightness here, but not much. It would stay basically the same. This side of the box, however, will, because of the white light source, will have its complement black, and that black will be exactly the same as the transparent film that we had for the cast shadow. Now, we add also to that, also because ambient light will play a factor, we add a touch of 
the blue ambient light. And so now this side of the box, if you can see, the white stripe has changed equally to what the green uh, portion of the box was into their shades and cooler shades because of the ambient light of blue. Now we're going to really complicate this more by recognizing that there is another factor called the, am or the reflected light and because this yellow is quite bright and it's being struck almost uh, full on by the white light, that yellow light bouncing off is going to affect that side facing the yellow and so we're going to drop in just a little gradation here if there's a little more yellow down below and you can just perceive ever so slightly this is a little bit lighter than this because of this light bouncing back and you can see it tends to be a little more green here yellow green than here where it's in more shade now we haven't finished this back box and so we have to follow the same procedures drop into that our gray which again is the same gray as we had here the blue for the ambient light color and because the magenta now not the yellow is predominant I'm just going to add a little gradation of magenta on that and you can see the bounce back here so we have concluded our cast shadow arrangement and what this white light in this particular position is going to do to a given set of colors and shapes. Using the same still life, changing only the position of the white light, placing it in front of the green box rather than as it was behind it, we can tell it's in front because where it touches the floor plane or ground point, this point indicates it's in front of this box so the cast shadow should fall behind and it should fall at the points indicated here much as we had in the previous. So having already uh, constructed the cast shadow we just simply have to have them come in and coincide with the, the points on established by the cast shadow and add the ambient blue and we have a cast shadow having already put in the, uh, the shaded side of this box just so that we can see how the shape and location of this shadow is determined by the position of not only the light and its source but also where that light is located on the ground two critical factors and then we'll put the finishing touch on here and our illusion is complete a white light playing on a set of colors and shapes. It's one o'clock. If the light source is not white, but rather amber, we would have a situation which is more like the lighting of late afternoon or early morning rather than the light of day, the white light. How does this change things? Well, to begin with, if I were a watercolors, for example, the first thing I would do is get rid of anything that's white in the painting because nothing can be of lighter value or of a different color than of the light source. So using a 50% amber film over the entire scene, what was white is now at least 50% amber. So this is a rather strong and very dominant amber light. This takes care of those areas which are in the light, but what about those in the shade? Well, the cast shadows, as we've seen before, we've already plotted, they change only in that instead of a black film, which would be the complement of a white light, our cast shadow now must basically be the complement of the amber, which in this case, as we can see here, has much more blue. It's still dark, but the, being the complement of the light amber, this would be the complementary color, and the transparency is determined by the artist who decides on how bright the light source will be. So once we've dropped that in, as you can see, by not even worrying about what the amber had done before, the amber has already grayed this blue-gray film, and we add to that the ambient light of the blue sky 
and we now have a cast shadow which tends to be much cooler than when we had simply the white light. The reason again being that the color of the shadow is a combination of ambient light and the complementary color of the light source which in this case is orange or amber. And we follow the same procedure as we did before dropping in both our complementary color of the light source as well as the ambient light. And the same procedures as we had followed before could be dropped in. Now we have a little problem here and the reflected lights might be somewhat different because I'm just using the one we had before with a white light, but this particular color now that was quite magenta has been transformed by the ambient color. So the reflection coming off this would be slightly different. Uh, this still looks plausible, so we'll leave it as such. We would also want to do the same as we had with the yellow, but seeing the yellow again, it is not the bright lemon yellow that we had before, but more of a cadmium yellow pale. Uh, note again how different the uh, blue here appears as we place over that the amber, which is almost its complement, making this almost a dark gray. In other words, this neutralizes more or tones, whereas those colors with already uh, either adjacent to amber, this being basically magenta and yellow, which created the amber, anything with magenta in it is not going to be dulled, but brightened, maybe a little more yellowish red, and simply a warmer uh, amber plus yellow, making this more of a yellow-orange. So just to show again how influenced that, that circle is there, you see how much brighter the blue is when I pull the amber off. And you'd say, well, look how blue this is here compared to this. Well, this is close to what it would be. The reason I punctuated the, the blue on the cast shadow was I already had some magenta in that and some yellow, which would have been the complement causing this blue to neutralize or tone. So uh, it just made it much, much more simple. And as I found in working with watercolor, it was much easier just to get rid of the white by painting the entire picture this amber and then dropping my various uh, cast shadows of these layers of film over the existing colors. And it looks quite convincing as it would in a condition of not white, but amber light.